Good morning to you all and a very warm welcome to Shabbat at the House. In case you're new to our group, the House is a house church. We often meet on Saturdays for what is called Shabbat at the House. You are currently watching this stream on our official YouTube channel, so if you'd like to subscribe, then you'll be alerted to future live events and also uploads. Also, you can watch recordings such as this one on our channel in your own time. Please also feel free to consult and follow our various social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. There we post what's happening and when, and we are a non-profit. So if you'd like to help us keep doing what we're doing, then you too can become a patron on our Patreon. The website is there on the screen for you to see. My name is Natalie Kendall, and I will be your host for today. This morning, we will be exploring a story found in the book of Luke. We're going to be sharing some music and singing together for those who want to, and we're also going to talk to God together as well. So that's a bit of what you can expect from your time together with us today. To begin this morning, we're going to sing a song called By Remembering We Rest, a song about the Sabbath, and the lyrics will be on the screen if you'd like to sing along. Stop pretending we're in charge. 
A couple of weeks ago, we introduced a brand new segment on Shabbat at the House called How to Be Image Bearers. In it, we share glimpses of the many and diverse ways which we can express and show God's love in this world. And today's example is taken from an Instagram post in which a mother shares a story about her toddler. She writes, When my daughter was two and a half, I was getting her ready for bed. I asked her, what do you want to talk about? And she said, me. That night, I told her all the brave things she did that day. The next night, I told her how special her hugs were. The following night, what kind things she did that day. Each night, I chose an attribute that has nothing to do with her appearance. And I will continue to do this every single night. I want her to understand she is much more than what she sees in the mirror. May we find inspiration from these loving examples and continue to voice appreciation and speak the beauty that we see in others out loud. Let's sing together another song, perhaps familiar to those who have visited us here before. It's called Living Letters. They see you 
Today, we are going to explore a story found in Luke chapter 10. But to understand it properly, we're going to move through the whole chapter to get some context on what's happening here and why. At the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus appoints 72 of his followers or his disciples to go ahead of him to each town and village he's about to visit. He says, go ahead of me and tell people of who I am and that I'm coming. Before Jesus sends out these 72 people, he gives them certain instructions about what they are to do and how they are to act as they go from town to town. His first instructions are about the households they may come across. We can read in verse 5. When you enter a house, first say, Shalom to this house. If a seeker of shalom is there, your shalom will belong there. And if there isn't, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eat and drink what they offer, for a worker deserves his wages. Don't move about from house to house. Now, Jesus' second instruction is about the towns they will come across. He says from verse 8, Wherever you come into a town where they make you welcome, eat what is put in front of you. Heal the sick there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go it to its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near you. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now, after these two instructions about households and towns, Jesus continues into verse 13. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So here we find Jesus speaking out against two specific towns in Israel, which he has already visited, the towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Now, he also mentions two other towns, Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are two towns not in Israel. They were at the time towns in the land of Syria and Phoenicia, which is in present day Lebanon. You can see them on the map in red. Now, Jesus spent a lot of his ministry around this area called Galilee, a region centered around the Sea of Galilee, which is really a huge lake. And in Galilee, as you can see on the map, there are two towns, Chorazin and Bethsaida, which he visited and was in the area of a lot. Now, here in Luke 10, Jesus is saying to these two Israelite towns, if I did the miracles I have done in your two towns, Chorazin and Bethsaida, in the lands of Phoenicia, they would have turned to me long ago. When he says they would sit in sackcloth and ash, it refers to an outward form of mourning common to that culture. In other words, Jesus is saying these non-Israelites, these non-Israelites would mourn their sin and turn to me for help. Jesus continues to speak to his disciples in verse 16. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. Jesus says, those who take time to hear what you're teaching and sharing with them, they are welcoming me. They are accepting me. But if someone doesn't accept me by default, they are actually rejecting the one who sent me. They are rejecting God. Now, after this lesson, these instructions are given, Jesus sends out the 72 followers. They go into towns and villages and homes and do as instructed. And when they return later, this is what they have to share. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. 
the disciples which Jesus has sent out are really excited upon their return. They tell Jesus about what's happening when they are traveling around. Jesus hears this and replies in verse 18. He replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So when the 72 return, they are joyful, saying, Lord, you have sent us out and these amazing things, these amazing miracles are happening. But Jesus replies in this striking way, he has seen something. He says the goodness, the healing, the kindness of God is spreading throughout the land. And Jesus says he has seen his enemy, the enemy of humankind, falling. In other words, the kingdom of God is really coming and he has already seen his enemy being brought low because God's blessings and help is coming to his people. And then this absolutely beautiful thing happens in verse 21. When Jesus hears and sees this, a wave of joy comes over him. Verse 21 says, At that moment, Jesus was filled with joy by the Holy Spirit. And he said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you because you conceal these things from the sophisticated and educated, yet revealed them to ordinary people. Yes, Father, I thank you that it pleased you to do this. At this moment, the Holy Spirit moves Jesus and fills him with joy. And that joy pours out of him in the words, Father, thank you for showing these truths, this light to children, to ordinary people, to those considered low or not smart or not special. He continues into verse 22. My father has handed over everything to me. Indeed, no one fully knows who the son is except the father and who the father is except the son and those to whom the son wishes to reveal him. Then, turning to his disciples, he said privately, how blessed are the eyes that see what you are seeing. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see the things you are seeing, but did not see them and to hear the things you are hearing but did not hear them. Now, what is Jesus talking about seeing and hearing? He's talking about himself. He's saying, you're looking right at me and hearing the words coming from my mouth, seeing how I'm helping people. You get to be in my presence. You get to see and you get to hear me. So that is the introduction to this chapter and the events which lead up to verses 38 to 42, where this happens. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to them. Jesus and his disciples, they continue traveling along from village to village. And when he comes to a certain village, a woman named Martha opens her home to them. She says, you and all your followers come to my house. Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was busy with all the work to be done. So going up to him, she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are fretting and worrying about many things. But there is only one thing which is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will not be taken away from her. So here we have a scene of Jesus and his followers coming to the home of two sisters, Martha and Mary. Martha, who is the eldest, acts as an excellent host. In fact, she's the one who invited Jesus into their home in the first place. She makes food for everyone, offers them a place to stay, is busy preparing and making things comfortable for Jesus and his disciples. But meanwhile, her sister Mary stays sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to everything he had to say. And Martha gets upset and frustrated. You can kind of understand why. Her younger sister is just sitting there. 
Mary isn't being a good host. Mary isn't being helpful at all. Martha is left by herself to do all the cooking and cleaning and preparations while her sister doesn't lift a finger to help. And so Martha turns to Jesus and says, um, don't you care that I've been left with all these things? Tell my youngest sister to help me. This almost sounds like a big sister going to a parent and saying, um, little sister isn't helping me and I have all this stuff to do. Tell her to help me. But what was Jesus' response? Now, you may remember that during a previous Shabbat at the house, we looked at the significance of the repetition of a word, specifically a name in the biblical text. This is a common literary method used by Hebrew authors when they're trying to draw the readers or the listener's attention to what is happening. It's important. It's a signal to pay attention to this. In verse 41, Jesus replies, Martha, Martha, you are fretting and worrying about many things, but there is only one thing which is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus' response to Mary being upset with her sister just sitting there and listening is, Martha, you are running about busy, worried about so many things. Your head is full of the details of your life, the things you think you have to do, the tasks you need to complete, your role as a host, as a woman, your head is full of these things. But he says, Martha, there is only one thing, one thing which is needed. Only one thing is necessary, is essential more than anything else. And that one thing, Mary has chosen it. She has chosen right. But what is Mary choosing? To stay seated? To not stress out? To be really zen? Well, the text says she sat at Jesus' feet and listened to everything he said. Mary sits by Jesus' feet and is just listening, soaking in, hanging on to every word coming from Jesus' mouth, everything he's teaching, just listening. And Jesus said, this right here, this is the right choice. Now we read elsewhere in the Gospels that Jesus has a close relationship with this particular family. It was a family consisting of three siblings, Lazarus, their brother, and Mary and Martha, his sisters. Now, the fact that Mary and Martha live in the same house as each other, as well as Lazarus, tells us that neither sister was likely to be married. So they are either unmarried or widows. And in the culture and context of the time, it was understood that women had particular roles in society. One huge such role consisted of hospitality, opening one's home, feeding strangers and visitors. Another role assigned to women was a submissive and lesser societal position compared to men. Men were considered the higher ranking in society while women came beneath that. They were expected, even in the synagogues, not to speak and to remain away from the main hall, perhaps in a separate room or at the back. And if any woman wanted to be considered honorable and decent and wanted to land a husband, she would adhere to these rules and expectations. Martha is... In fact, Martha is doing very well in this story. She is doing exactly what you want a woman to do in that time. Martha is a decent woman. Martha is wife material. But what is her younger sister doing? Well, Mary isn't doing what she ought to be, is she? She isn't serving or helping or hosting. In fact, she is sitting by the feet of Jesus, which means she is sitting in a room filled with men. She's there with the disciples of Jesus, of which at the time, under one roof, there was about 72 of them, if we estimate that most of them were men. And there is Mary, an unmarried woman, not accompanied by a chaperone, sitting at the feet of Jesus among all these men, learning like a man and being a bad host. 
And then in front of everybody, Martha shames her. That's not how a proper lady should act. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't put down Mary. Instead, he lifts her up and honors her. He says, there is a bunch of noise and non-essential things in life, Martha, but there is one thing, the one essential thing in life, the one needed thing is me. And all those other things that nag at you, that worry you, that make you feel like you need to control your life, those are just not as important. They're just fluff compared to this. Mary has understood what the meaning of her time here is, what the meaning of her life is. It's Jesus. Listening to Jesus, being with him, sitting at his feet, that's the thing which matters most in this moment. And Mary has chosen well. All the pressures of society couldn't stop Mary from being there. All the expectations of others couldn't stop her from being there. All those voices saying what her life should look like and what her role was and what her place was couldn't stop Mary. And Jesus concludes, nobody is going to take this away from her. In other words, Jesus is saying, Mary has chosen the right thing and no one is going to take the gift I'm giving her away from her. The gift is myself. The quality time I'm spending with Mary, nobody is going to rob her of that. Now, we read earlier in the chapter of how Jesus' followers were sent out and he had instructed them, wherever you're welcomed, wherever people want to listen, stay there. They are blessed people. And wherever people don't want to hear about me, leave that place behind. And if you remember, he was comparing towns, saying, if I did in a foreign town what I do in the towns of Israel, they would turn to me. They would come running to me. This whole chapter in Luke is about two types of reactions to Jesus and his kingdom. Two ways of reacting when he comes by. It's about how people react when the thing that really matters the most in this world, that is the most important thing in the universe, comes to your town, to your home, to your life. If you remember, the disciples were so excited that spirits had left people in Jesus' name. They were excited about the miracles. But Jesus simply said, the thing you should be celebrating isn't the flash and the glory of it. It's not, ooh, look what God has made me be able to do. Instead, he says, find joy in that your names are written in heaven and that you are seeing and experiencing the most important thing in life, me. On the one hand, earlier in the same chapter, Jesus was correcting the disciples' priorities. And in this story, Mary, the youngest sister, has exactly the right priorities. She knew what was the most important thing that day and in her life. It was Jesus, sitting with Jesus, learning from him, listening to him, spending time with him, being accepted and received by him. And Jesus honors and protects her decision, even by challenging those who would bombard her with attacks, attacks of improper behavior and gender roles and familial expectations. I don't know what your life looks like at the moment. Maybe it's crowded with many things to do, so many things to pay attention to. You may feel overwhelmed. Maybe you're working really hard to make your life look like what you've been told it's supposed to look like. Or other people have said, if you are successful or lead an acceptable life, it needs to look like this. But when we stick with Jesus, we are given freedom from many of those man-made social constructs and expectations. Whether those expectations revolve around busyness, assigned roles or ranking. Around Jesus, we are released from the chains of social status and many of the prisons which we've been conditioned to, like our worry about people seeing us in a certain way or our status in a social group. 
we're given permission to stop chasing what the world around us says we must be, and we're simply allowed to be here. Following Jesus doesn't mean being irresponsible people or not engaging with the world. It doesn't mean never doing the dishes, but it comes with a promise that anyone who chooses to spend their life around Jesus, spending time with him, learning at Jesus' feet, aren't throwing their life away. That is the promise. And like Mary, we realize that around Jesus, we don't have to earn our keep or our place, be useful or productive. He's just happy to have us there, and nothing matters as much as being with him. This is where the true joy and living is. That is the true reward. That is where the enemy falls. And as Jesus said, nothing in this world will ever take away from someone who chooses to sit at his feet. To conclude this thought, we are going to take a moment to be quiet together. So if you have something to write on and something to write with, you can grab that now. And I'd like to invite you to write a note to God today, if you'd like. Something that's on your mind, maybe a request or a question or a thought. And we'll be quiet for a couple of minutes while we write this down. Thank you for taking part. Perhaps you'd like to keep that note with you during this week. You can keep it as a reminder or a prayer um, if you feel like it. That's it from us here at Shabbat at the House. Thank you to each of you for sharing your time with us today. An HD version of the recording of this of today's Bible story will be uploaded to our channel so you can go and watch that later on. Otherwise, I wish each of you a meaningful week. May God's peace be with you. And may you have the courage to be kind to those around you and to yourself. Shabbat Shalom. See you next time.